You know the vibes. Welcome back to another episode of the Hoop Genius Podcast brought to you by NBA 2K23. I am Mo Mootsi and alongside me is always the one, the only, Mr. BJ Armstrong. BJ, how you doing? I'm doing well, Mo. Real name, no gimmicks. And, uh, you know, Mo, I was just thinking after yesterday's show, Mm-hmm. It's almost that time, you know. I, I, I'm ready to start ramping things up a little bit, mm-hmm. get ready for the playoffs. Because I want to say this today. After yesterday's show, I came. I, I realized something. After, after, actually, after watching the games last night, I think this is going to be the first playoffs in a long time that there's going to be no clear cut favorite. And when I say clear cut, like we're saying. You know, like when the Warriors actually were running away with it, or when the Miami Heat yeah. had LeBron, like that. You, you know, to be there. you know, I was watching the game last night, and there was a game that really just, you know, it really it 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 hit a little different. I was watching the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Golden State Warriors last night, mm-hmm. and clearly, the 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 Warriors have the better talent, you know, the best player right now, and that's Steph Curry. But I was like. OKC has the best team. Yeah. And it, 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 it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, the, the Warriors weren't playing well. It was just like Josh Giddy and company and Shea Alexander and these guys, they are a better team than the Golden State Warriors. And the Warriors, listen, you know, Steph is Steph and Draymond and Clay and those guys. But Josh Giddy and these guys are really, really good. Yeah, okay. they had seven double digit scorers in that game against the Warriors. That's what I'm saying. And, and, and I and 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 then that's when I said, this is gonna be this is gonna be an interesting playoffs because anyone is capable. The mm-hmm. plan, you know, I was like, OKC made me realize something. That's a that's a pretty good team. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And if they I, got into a play in game, they could win. A play against anybody. And that 10th spot in the play-in, the Pelicans, the OKC Thunder, the Trailblazers, and the Jazz, they all have pretty much the same record right now. They're all 15 games behind first seed. So, And then I turned on it, I, and speaking of the Jazz, the Jazz, it was a tie game with like a minute Ooh, to go. Yes. that could. I mean, Kyrie was terrific down the stretch. Set, However, set, what did he have, 17 in the fourth? Yeah, he was terrific in the fourth. However, I was like, the Jazz... They they're doing things now on the road. So I'm like, this is going to be interesting this year in the playoffs. And it's time to start gearing it up, Mo, because well, anything can happen. I want to switch back to that Warriors game for a quick second. Did you see the okay. play that I sent you? I sent you a WhatsApp with the play where Draymond Green's wide open in the middle of the court and Jordan Poole has the ball. And Jordan right. Poole refuses to pass the ball to Draymond Green. And right. Draymond Green, as the OKC go the other way on offense, Draymond just walks off the court. What right. did you make of that? You know, I I I I I had a a similar every player has had that situation, right? A situation where you're open. I don't know, maybe that maybe that was the play. Seemed like everybody knew what was going on. But I I I've learned something as a guard. And and it took me a while to learn it, but I I learned it. When people don't pass you the ball, is because they don't see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When people don't pass you the ball, it's because they don't see you. Right? Draymond, clearly from the angle of the television, he looked open. Yeah. Clearly from maybe the other three positions on the floor, he was probably open. But from Jordan Poole's angle, he couldn't see him. So that's all there that's is. What it's, I, it's that's, personal, what I, that's what I've. That's what I've. Personal grudge. No, that's, that's what. I, that's what I've learned, especially in a situation where you're in, where they they have to win now. Oh yeah, you, you, they have to win. You they, just said it's time it, to it, ramp it, it up. It, yeah, it, it, they have to win. So, what I learned as a as a point guard is people don't pass you the ball because they don't see you. Okay. And you may be like, man, this dude looking me off, or man, this is here. No. Jordan, if you watch Jordan Poole play, if you 
and I'm watching the game, and Mo, I can't help it. Like I, I, I tell you this all the time. So it's, it's a fault of mine. I can't watch the game as a fan. Like I want to watch it as a fan. Jordan Poole, not because he's selfish. He misses a lot of passes during the course of a game. If you ever watch him and you know the position that he plays, mm -hmm. he misses a lot of passes. Yeah, because he's just trying to score. He's not really what, a what, what, passing's not an emphasis of his game. What, whatever the case may be, whatever the case may be, he misses a lot of passes. Okay. A lot of times he's late on a lot of passes. And that's how you know people would say, well, point guard, you know, is point guards, are they, can you create a point guard or, or they just are? You, either you see it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And people who have an, 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 an innate ability to pass, it's just something that you, you just do. Like, you know, like, you know, when you see great guards, just throw it up ahead. That's just like, you'll yeah. be like, oh, this guy understands the position. Or this guy doesn't understand the position. He may have made the pass. He may have had 15 assists. But we all know the difference between a guy who's making a read and a guy who can pass. And just because you have a lot of assists doesn't mean you know and understand the game or the position. So I don't, I'm not mad at Jordan Poole because if you watch him, and I've watched him now for years, he misses a lot of passes. And it's because he can't see it. But why should I expect him to see it when I personally understand the position? And, okay. and that's okay. And and he he just missed it. I but I but I do know this. Do I think he's trying to win? Yes. Do I think he understands the importance of the game? Yes. Do, did he miss Draymond Green? Certainly from the angle, but I didn't, I can't see it from his angle, right? A lot of times, but when you're under duress. You can't see things. Mm -hmm. So speaking of missing things, uh, one person who didn't miss anything the other night uh, was at Pau Gasol's retirement ceremony, his former teammate and yes. his friend, Jimmy Butler. Now, this is interesting to me. What's their connection? What's their connection? They played together on the Bulls. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy loves spending time in Europe, so he must spend some time in Barcelona, you know, all those kind of things. But, but here's what's right. interesting to me. And this is why I need you guys to subscribe to the podcast so that one day I can hopefully live life like Jimmy Butler. He played a game at home on Monday against the Atlanta Hawks. On Tuesday, he flew to LA to watch Pau Gasol's jersey retiring. And now Wednesday, he's playing a game at home against the Cleveland Cavaliers. The wow. Miami Heat are in the midst of a six-game homestand, and it's a crucial part of the season, as we've just been discussing. And right now, we're looking at the Miami Heat as the seventh seed, and the Hawks aren't that far behind them. You know, the seventh seed and the sixth seed, if you make a little run here and you get to the sixth seed, you're automatically in the playoffs. You stay as the seventh seed, and Brooklyn, because because it looks like the Knicks aren't going to slow down, it's only really the Brooklyn Nets now who have a little cushion at that sixth spot. The Miami Heat should be trying to do, every, they should win every game. So for Jimmy Butler to take a whole day to travel to Los Angeles, which is the other, how long is that flight? Six hours? Seven hour flight? Um, it's it's, 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 it's got to be six or It's got to be I, I've seven not been hours. to Miami, so I don't, I don't know yet, but hopefully I'll go there soon. But to go there, so that's what? 14, 15 hours on a plane. Of course, it'll be a private jet or a business class flight, whatever. 14 hours, 15 hours on a plane. And then the time, of, so there's 24 hours between these games, right? There's 48 hours between these games, right? And 24 of those hours you spent in Los Angeles or in the sky. So now you've got two games coming up at home against Cleveland, who are also trying to improve their seeding. And then you've got Orlando on Sunday, which, okay, cool. I guess if you were playing against the Orlando Magic next, and this is no due respect to, no disrespect to Orlando Magic, maybe I could see it, okay? But no, you're playing against the Cavs, who are a tough opponent, what are you doing, Jimmy Butler? I understand your friendship with Pau Gasol. And I understand it's a big deal to have your jersey retired. Is it that big of a deal that you need to skip town for a whole day? I don't know. It'd be different if they were out on the West Coast on a road trip. But for me, if if you're his teammate, are you not looking at that and be like, this guy's supposed to be our leader? You know, he had this whole thing in the bubble of, oh, yeah, I work harder than everyone. Da, da, da. I don't know, PJ. You tell me what you think. Well, like, first of all, I, I didn't know that. I didn't look at their schedule. 
I just assume when I saw it last night that, oh, they must be playing the Lakers <laughs> or, or the Clippers. It's a six-game homestand in Miami. The opposite yeah, I, I side I just of the assume. <laughs> I just assume that they were playing, the, you know, sometime, you know, the Lakers were playing. They're in town to play a back-to-back Clippers, Lakers, like most teams, right? If you get yeah. in town early, all right, I can see you go to the game, support your boy, da-da-da. Okay. I was listening to you say that in, in astonishment, right? You yeah. Know? Um, and I'm just saying to myself, listen, I, I, I know these athletes are very well conditioned. I think they're in phenomenal shape, da, da, da. However, that's a lot of stress on the body, especially this time of the year when people, you know, are ramping things up now, right? You know, everyone's trying to fight for seating. Every game matters. Mm-hmm. You know, every game matters. I don't care who you're playing. Every game matters because it's, you know, it, the difference between making the playoffs, getting in the playoffs, getting the 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 team that you may match up against. Well, they determine. need to get into the playoffs instead playing, of the playing. Yeah. Like that's as simple as it gets. So I I I listen. Being on the plane for that length of time, and then having to play in a game. Now, that's pushing it. That's pushing it now. That mm-hmm. that's that's really pushing things here. So I don't know. Maybe he knows something. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, Maybe yeah. He, he, he could come out and score 40 and lead lead them to a winning as okay. Cleveland. And fair play uh, to him okay. if he does. But well, based on what I based on what I understand about the NBA and what I know. Now these, these guys, I don't know. Maybe they have workouts on the plane now i have no idea <laughs> I, I don't well bj don't if they know. did if they did i'm sure you'd see it on instagram and you'd get angry about that yeah, as well yeah, yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying <laughs> I, I don't grinding. know yeah i don't know i must i'm gonna assume they had a day off and that's how he spent his day off. i don't know i well, I, don't I mean know. you've got two games coming up against the Cavs. who are a good opponent you'd want to be able to I, to I, I just hope i just around. hope that, they that we don't have to discuss this again because <laughs> yeah, if he yeah. plays if he plays bad <laughs> Everyone's going to recall this because I didn't know the story until you were telling it. And it's, yeah. it's a wild type of moment. It, it really is a wild type of moment. But if he plays well and scores 40 and they win both games, nothing will be said. But if he doesn't play well. Mm-mm. Or if he's man, on load management. But yeah, that's, mm. that's, yeah, that's, I, 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 but, you know, we'll see. It's we will see. Because I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, you know, speaking of load management, uh, we have some bad news from the New Orleans Pelicans. Brian Windhorst is reporting that Zion Williamson is not close to returning, and there was a significant setback in his recovery. Now, the Pelicans, who were my dark horse to to come out of the West at the start of the year, started off the season fantastically. They've now plummeted down. They're currently the 10th seed. They've lost their last two games. They're 3-7 and over their last 10 games, I believe. They are in a horrendous run of form, so it's not great news. You know, that it, you know, I, I wanna, is I, not coming back. Okay, I want to say this. Obviously, Zion is a very impactful player. That that's clear, right? I think we all can agree with that. Is it just me? I still think that's a good team, whether he's playing or not. Yeah, this is Especially this is the thing that I wanted to that, ask you about, CJ McCollum. Brandon Ingram, Jonas Valanciunas, Trey Murphy, Herb Jones. Like, they have guys. Yeah. One yeah. player I, shouldn't I get, swing yeah. the needle because we all talked about the depth of their squad. The start of the season, over the offseason, we talked about the depth of the Pelicans. And even without Zion last season, in that series against the Phoenix Suns, they were looking dangerous. They were looking, they might take out the best team in the NBA, record-wise, in the first round. So for that to suddenly drop off to what it is now... CJ and Brandon have been a little inconsistent, I guess, but what's really going on there? Okay, I'm glad you asked. So, you know, I, I watch teams because I'm like, I like their roster. Like, I, I think they have good players over there. I don't think they have a roster that should be losing 10 games in a row. Yeah, they're three and seven, but but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, at some point this season, they lost like 10 games in a row. Now they've lost like they last three or four so this is what I this is what I see in the NBA. If you're going to be a good team, you have to have a player, preferably a lead guard, who can play downhill. Because Mo, there's a couple of things that really that we know 
translates to a winning brand of basketball. One, a guard who plays downhill. And we know if you can create the pace that you play at, if you can create the space and have shooters on the floor, it gives you a significant advantage in the way the game is played today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you start playing defense, you, in particular transition defense, if you rebound the basketball, okay, limit your turnovers, so forth and so on. Now, Mo, you have a pretty good team. There's a glaring thing that's missing from this New Orleans Pelicans. Okay. It's not coaching. It's not talent. They don't have a player who plays downhill. Except for Zion. Except for Zion. It's a it's glaring. Like, let me tell you, if you really want to watch a well coached team this year, okay, and all these guys are well coached, but the Sacramento Kings coach right now, Mike Brown, he's coaching at it. Mike Brown is coaching at an incredible high level, okay? Yep. And I watched them play New Orleans, was it last night or the night before? I can't remember. All these games just go together. I watched Della Nadova play the point guard position and i was very impressed and, and he, people people bad. laughed because i remember talking about him on this show and people laughed when when they signed okay. him no, no, no and, and and here's what i'm gonna say delon the is not fast he wasn't really fast even in his heyday but he's really not fast <laughs> now. Okay. i like it because i'm watching someone i can relate to now yeah but you know what he plays very quick he makes quick decisions yep he moves the ball ahead yep and he ran the team and played at the Sacramento Kings pace the other night, and it was, was much faster than New Orleans. And I was like, wait a minute, Dylan Nadova is playing faster than the New Orleans Pelicans. So mm. I started watching the game because I wanted to see how a, 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 a veteran who, you know, he's got some years on him now, oh, yeah. how he plays in today's game and makes it work. And I was like, oh, wow, the New Orleans Pelicans can't play at a pace. CJ McCullough doesn't play downhill. Brandon Ingram doesn't play downhill. Do you think they have a lot of good talent, but they don't just play downhill? Do you think CJ not being a true point guard, as you were to call it, um, is a is a factor in this because he runs at the one? They've had some games with him and Josh Richardson in the backcourt against the Kings. They had him and Herb Jones starting in the backcourt. Do you think that they need like a point guard, point guard? Because CJ is more of a scoring guard. Here, 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 here. Oh, listen. There are a lot of people who can mimic the position. In today's game, you can mimic this position. Wow. Because if you are a scoring guard and you play with pace, you can mimic the position today. Why? Because no one is playing offense more than like 10 or 12 seconds. It's not like it was in the old days where you made passes, you get it to the weak side, then you play a two-man game, you play it in the inside, feed the post. No, guys are like, here's the offense mode. You come down, you make a pass. If you don't have the three, you call the big out, you play screen roll, you either shoot a three, the guy goes pick and pop, he goes pick and roll. If he's a good big, he can catch the ball, swing it to the corner, and you go, great play, next play. That's how the game is moving that fast now, okay? And you want a guard who can come down and play. So you can mimic the position. However, C.J. McCullough doesn't mimic the position. Yeah. He's a scoring guard. Yeah. He's a, he's a scoring guard. And, and you know what? And CJ can score in the half court. I mean, he can score. Now, he doesn't play with and doesn't dictate the pace of the game. You know, like, like, and you, I, I, I tell you this all the time. Everyone has something that they can do and something they can't do. However, if CJ is going to be the primary ball handler on this team, he has to understand he has to create the pace so that the team will play at the pace unlike the pace he's they're playing at now because do, they're following him. Do you think they should move CJ to the two and bring in maybe an Alvarado what I think that, to run point styling or bring in another point guard from elsewhere? Well, uh, here's the thing. You know, Mo, you, you have to play a couple things, right? You got to shoot the ball. Shooting is a real thing now. Yeah. You have to shoot the ball, Mo. That, that's just, that's, we have to say that. But here's the a, here's a other thing. You have to be able to play screen roll. And you have to play downhill where and force the other team to say, if our transition defense is not right or we're not getting back in transition, this, this is going to be a long night. Yeah. Okay. The, the regular Look, season Mo, game because, is just so much transition. Like, what was the game yeah, that I watched the other day? I watched the game the other day and it was like, 
literally our whole core was literally just end to end. It was like we we were talking about it. we were watching at the same time, and it was like there was just no defense, and they were just running up and down end to end. So when you're looking at yeah. the regular season and, and at the last ten game stretch, you have to be able to attack in transition. Yeah. So uh, so when you when you get the game is predicated on getting stops. If you get a stop, Mo, that's a significant advantage because now you get a stop. And a stop means you got to get the rebound. So if the other team gets the offensive rebound, you're still on defense. So if you get a stop, the team gets the rebound, the number one priority with all of the teams in the top five as, as a defensive team in this league is transition defense. Yep. Why? Because everyone's running where, Mo? They don't run to get a layup. Anymore. They run to the they wings. Run to you the, have two do they have run to the run to the corners and to then the, the other shoes run. To get the Before three point you shot. run the lane. Right, and you're trying to get left. Now, now they're running. They just <laughs> disperse out to get wide open threes because so the, the, they want to stretch the defense. And I get it. Like if I'm the Milwaukee Bucks and Giannis has got the rebound, I'm running to the corner because I want Giannis to have a clear lane to the hoop because they're going to have to put three defenders in the lane, and I'm going to be wide open. But you're, if I'm exactly on the right. Pelicans and Herb Jones gets a rebound or or Senior McCollum gets a rebound. Why am I running to the wings? Because the defense isn't going to be too worried about them guys going coast to coast. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You got. You have to have a guard. When Zion is there, down here. it works. I'm going to run it's, to the corner because Zion's going to go and throw that down over three people. But you, you're exactly right. You, you, you're exactly right. That, that's it. So they get the rebound. They get out. Your transition defense has to be impeccable in today's game. So whether you're Cleveland, the Celtics, Milwaukee, all and, the best teams who play defense, and it's they have you, great transition defense. You do have to sacrifice some level of offensive rebounding for that transition defense to be set. I would argue. I would argue that that's not the case. I would argue why, because if you are sending, you know, if 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 I were in the NBA today, I would put a huge emphasis on offensive rebounding. Why? Because no one blocks out anymore. Yeah, we've seen yeah. that. <laughs> okay. I think okay. I, I think if I sat courtside, I could sneak in for a few rebounds. Yeah, no, no one blocks out. No, but I why? could get eight because rebounds. Why does anyone block out? Because now it's everyone says, well, we're shooting long shots, so it's long rebounds. No one's ever in position. So if if it were me, one of the principles is you're still on defense mode if I get that offensive rebound. Yep. So and more, more time than not, it's a putback anyway. It's an easy two. Yeah, yes. So I'm sending guys to the offensive rebound. I'm going to re offensive rebound. That to me, that's why I like I was like, God, if Dennis Robin played today, as good as he was in that era, he would be incredible in this era. Why? Because athletically, he's as fast as any guy in this era or whatever era he plays in. And he can offensive rebound. So I would send guys to the offensive rebound because that would force you not to get out on the break. I mean, imagine Mo, you playing against a Dennis Robin. You can't get out on the break. Why? Because you know every single time he's going to the offensive glass, which is going to force you to do what? You have to, to stay get below back the and free block throw him out. Yeah. You got to get back. That's what I'm saying. Because Mo, if he gives you 10 offensive rebounds, that's, that's 10 points. extra possession. That's 20. No, no, Mo. No, Mo. No, that, that it's times three. Yeah, because you stop the other the, team getting their possession team, too. So that's that's yeah. That's a 30 point swing, is what you're saying. That's a 30. Exactly. That's what I'm saying, Mo. And we all know what's the number one shot when you get an offensive rebound because everyone is scattered, is to throw it out to the three. That's the that's the best shot in basketball. An off offensive rebound because you can see the rim as a small guy for the entire time or any shooter. So mm -hmm. I would argue that offensive rebounding would be a high priority if I were in the league with my team. Because I'm going to force you to box me out. Because if, if you're playing small ball against me and I offensive rebound it, it doesn't really matter. Like, for instance, we used to play the member run TMC mode yep. for the Golden State Warriors. Yep. Our whole offensive philosophy for that game was offensive rebound. Yeah, because we you would shoot the we would shoot the ball just so we could offensive rebound it. We didn't shoot it to make it. You just like, just shoot it. Because our advantage was we're going to offensive rebound our way and just make you play below the free throw line. 
Yeah, well, they're 11th or they're 12th in offensive rebounding. I think the Pelicans are 11th in the NBA right now in offensive rebounds per game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not too too bad of a a point of no. emphasis for the Pelicans per se. But do you mean? But, the, but that would have to be the that would be that would that would have to be that's their pace. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you always. Okay, Mo, you you hear people say this. We have to impose our will on the game. Mm -hmm. We have to impose our will on the game. So you say, okay, we're going to, when you come in against the New Orleans Pelicans, which I don't think teams are saying this, maybe they are. You don't say, this is a great offensive rebounding team. We have to really box out and, and, and really take care of that end of the basketball. What I think they say against this team is, let's get out and run against them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's get out and run against them. And we don't have to worry about them playing downhill. See, when you play against De'Aaron Fox, when you play against, you know, you know, players that's playing, when you play against the Milwaukee Bucks, mm -hmm. Tyrese Maxey, when you play against these guys, you got to, you're like, okay, hey guys, tonight we got to get back because they, they, they play downhill. Yeah, you know what I mean. Right now, Jalen Brunson for the Knicks, for instance, he's playing downhill right now. He's yeah, really, he's playing. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and when you when you play against the Portland Trailblazers, you know Damian Lillard is he's playing downhill. Steph Curry playing downhill. If you don't have that now, Mo, it's really really hard to play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. It's really hard because you have because everything now is predicated on what driving kick. Yeah. OK, if you can't play downhill, the, your second option, which has become. The, the, I mean, it was a it was always a play that you ran. It was a very, you know, play that was very always utilized is a screen roll. If you have a guard who can't score off the screen roll, Mo, you're probably not a good team in yeah. today's game. <laughs> that, that's OK. Your guard has to come off and score. Why? Because his job is to do what? He's got to create a, a secondary defender so that he can, what, do driving kick for the other guys who are standing in the corners or throwing a lob or whatever. If he can't score, Bo, oh, you're probably not a good team in today's game. Yeah. Because I never have to compromise my defense. So every team in the league is looking for a player who can score or play downhill with a primary ball handler preferably your point guard or, you know, Giannis is clearly a, a very unique player, but you need that in today's game. If you're going to be good. I hear it. I definitely do hear it. You know, um, and when we're looking at teams playing in transition, um, I'm trying to pull up the numbers here for the Pelicans. The Pelicans are middle of the road. They're, they're in the middle of the pack when it comes to points generated in transition. So that's an area of looking at it. But speaking of transition defense, that brings me nicely to how I want to end the show. We talked the other day about the top five shooters in this league. And, you know, now we're talking about transition defense and defense in general. BJ, I want from you your top five shot blockers in the NBA. Not top five defensive players. Your top five just purely shot blockers. If you were playing today and you were driving at the rim, who are the top five guys that you wouldn't want to see waiting under the basket for you? Well, just off the top. You know, your your guy Rob Williams is he he's somewhere in there. I don't know who's one or two. Rob Williams. You know, you got two on one team. I, I'm gonna say Giannis, but probably Brooke Lopez is probably he probably has more block shots. But Giannis to me is an exceptional because he can, can recover. You can put both of them. Yeah, but 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 there's some there's some Rudy Gobert is really good. Okay. Rudy Gobert is 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 he's excellent i think um you know who, who you know who who I, I because i know he's going to come after it he does a great job of chasing this bismack biombo busy i think if he got more minutes then you can see biz, more of it biz chases biz chases every like he doesn't block it probably at the frequency of the other guys but he chases every block he he's like and this is what I love about Biz. You know, like some guys, you know, don't want to get dunked on. Oh, he don't care. 
he, he, he doesn't care. Here's the, other thing that, here's the other thing that's worth knowing in terms of there's sometimes great defenders that don't get the blocks, but altering the opponent's shot yeah, is enough yeah. to make them miss. Yeah, yeah. But when and it he comes, comes after every shot. When it comes to purely blocking, I think Jaron Jackson Jr. is up there. Nick Claxton. Miles Turner seems to always have loads of blocks, but it doesn't look like guys are too afraid of him. Walker Kessler, the rookie in Utah, has been sensational blocking shots as well. But so, so let's, who's your top five? You've got Rob Williams, you've got Giannis, you've got Biz. Rob Williams, Rob Williams. Okay, here's my, I'm just, okay. Rob Williams gets it. Okay, I look for guys who block shots, but the physicality in which they block them means something. Yeah, okay, you want to spot that. Because, <laughs> no, no, I look, some guys are shot blockers. Some guys are rim protectors. Okay, th- tell, me the dif- tell me the difference. Okay, so, so a shot blocker, like, for instance, I think, I think uh, the kid from Memphis, Jaron Jackson, Jaren I think Jackson. he's a shot blocker. Yeah, but I don't think he's a rim protector. So you think like Brooke Lopez is more of a rim protector? Brooke Lopez protects the rim. Bismack protects the rim. See, there, there's a difference. Miles I don't like Turner the play against rim. A shot blocker. He's a shot blocker. I think he's a shot blocker. But he should be, in my opinion, he should be a rim protector. I think he should be. I think he does because a good of his job. side. Because yeah. of his side. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying he doesn't do a good job. Listen, guy, whatever he blocks, he blocks a lot of shots. Bo Bo, shot blocker. She's a shot blocker. See there. See, I I don't like to play Zubac, I, rim protector. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that yeah, looking I, I at this, this list is more to do with the athleticism of the players, rather more so than well, like because a lot see, of the guys we're saying are shot blockers. They've just got younger legs, and I think the well, guys here, that we're saying are older, but they're here just is leg or, or older. See, but but. Again, again, this is just me. I like guys who control the paint. Yeah. And you, you're on the ground much more than you're in the air. And I learned this a long time playing in the NBA, and I learned it from the difference between tall guys and big guys. I like big guys because the big guys control the paint. Yeah. Okay? Now – I just happen to have played against some of the greatest shot blockers, rim protectors, probably in a, in a, in, in that era. Yeah. Akeem Olajuwon not only blocked shots, he controlled the paint. You got to know how to control the paint. Yeah. And I am a huge, I'm huge. Like Brooke Lopez controls the paint. Rob Williams and Al Horford. When they're together and they're really playing at a high level, they control the paint. Draymond Green is not a shot blocker. However, he controls the paint. Yeah. You, you, got, you got to know the difference. Okay. So, so, so just like, tell like me, Mark, so, so tell me so then, again, as a guard, who are you not trying to see when you attack the paint? Okay. The, the kid. I'm going to tell you, there's a kid right now that has a chance to be, he should be defensive player of the year based on his trajectory right now. And that's Mitchell Robinson. I wouldn't want to play against Mitchell Robinson. Why? Because he's learned and he's learning how to play the game without being an offensive player. I always watch for players like that. Like if I was in the NBA, I would be trying to get him because he anchors a team, affects the game totally for the Knicks, just like Rob Williams does and has no offensive input. Yeah, just just lobs offensive rebounds. rebounds, And he understands how to anchor. See, you, see, you, you got to understand. Like, yep. So you, you understand. Yep. Like Joel Embiid, he knows what to do. He just doesn't want to do it anymore. Like <laughs> he he should be, he's like Shaq to me. Like I would always watch out. This is what I, this is my, this is always my test for Shaq. Okay. How does he get his first foul? He, t- that, that told me how he wants to play today. If he was really Shaq that day, his first foul would be like, okay, no one comes in the lane. And everybody knew it because he would foul yeah. so hard on his first foul that everyone would see like, oh, big fellas, he's on one today. Yeah. <laughs> if he came in and he kind of gave you the, you know, the half, you know, he he was trying to get out of the way. Yeah. And, he, you know, and then you're like, okay, we got a chance. When the big fella was the big fella, mm-hmm. you had Enforcer. no <laughs> you had You had no chance because he was a rim protector shot blocker. So that's my criteria. So Mitchell Robinson, Brooke Lopez, and Giannis. Okay. That's three. Okay. Rob Williams. Four. 
one more spot. I'm going. I'm going to say Rudy. I mean, go I'm going to say Rudy. I'm going to say Rudy. But but deep down, like Bismack does it for me because I know he's coming and he's taking hard fouls. But if if Rudy go Rudy Gobert can't take a hard foul just because of his body type. But I I know Rudy is going to show up. Yeah. I want like you you understand like Kevin Garnett showed up with a hard foul. That's yeah. just as important as showing up with a great block. Yeah. You understand you what I'm tone. saying? You got to set the tone. You got to set my You got to set the tone. You don't come in. Yes. Here. That's well, what man, I do in pickup exactly. games and people don't like it. But yeah, um, yeah, and that's imp- <laughs> that's important. That's important. That, that that's the one thing that people don't understand. That's very important. If you get a foul and it's a foul. Mhm. That sets the tone like, okay, you guard, stay out of here. Like, for instance, I played with a phenomenal rim protector, Bill Cartwright. He was phenomenal. You wouldn't think of Bill as a shot blocker, but every guard in the league knew if you came in the lane, expect this contact. (laughs) I'm not trying to hurt you, but expect this contact. If I don't block it, you're not getting an and one here. Now, you may get an and one tomorrow night or you may did it the night before but when you came in with the big fella there and that was the that was the formula in the nba now you don't see that as much because the bigs we've we've really regulated or we've really devalued the bigs in this league because we're all looking to guard the three-point line however if you know that you're playing against a guy and he's going to show up with his chest every single time that's a huge scene in the mindset of an offensive player. Mm-hmm. That's a huge scene. And, and, and Jaron Jackson is a good shot blocker. I think he's a good shot blocker. However, I would love to see Steven Adams to me is the key to their defense because he shows up with the hard foul every single time and playing through contact mode is an art. You know what I mean? And we talked, yeah. talked about Julius Randle. Julius Randle may be the most physical four man outside of Zion in the NBA right now. Just because he can play through the kind. He's strong enough to play through contact. All great players, they're big, they're strong, and they can play through contact. Mm-hmm. Okay. At whatever position you're at. So Steven Adams, to me, if I could put him in the position and then have a, a, a shot blocker behind him like Jaron Jackson, that's the perfect scenario. Yeah, just like Giannis. Giannis is really Giannis on defense because Brooke Lopez shows up and protects the rim. Yeah, and that is and Al Horford is to me. Look, Rob Williams is phenomenal when he's healthy. Mm-hmm. Okay, but the guy who always shows up at the rim, not only him, the other guy, Marcus Smart, does it too. Marcus Smart shows and up. He's at a the rim. point guard. And he's a point guard. That's what I'm saying. It's just unique things that you see sometimes. You go, you know what? I, I have to say this. Marcus Smart was guarding Julius Randle the other day, and he did a pretty, not pretty he, good. He did, he did a, a darn good job, job as he, a guard, uh-huh. and he handled the physicality of the game. There was only one thing that was missing. There was no Rob Williams to block the shot. Mm-hmm. You, you, you follow yeah. me? So yeah. Al Horford rim protects. Al Horford plays the game with his chest. You got to be a man to play the game with your chest. Mm-hmm. Okay, you you, 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 you know, everyone wants to push and do these things. When you're strong and you're a man, you start playing the game with your chest. Draymond Green plays the game with his chest. That That's, that, that's to me, that's the key to being a great, especially interior defender. Can you take the blow, Mo, with yep. your chest? Yep. And when you, you see have that your cool interior strength. guy, you got to have Al Horford and, 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 and Brooke Lopez and Giannis and these guys. You got to be sturdy. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, you can't be like a Chet Holmgren or a Paul Zingas, respectfully to those guys. Absolutely. They don't That's have the saying. frame That's... to be able to play like that. You got to be strong. Wim ben, yeah. Wim ben Yama impressed me because I was like, I saw him do something that impressed me. Besides all of his skill, like he can shoot and do all these things. Okay, he's phenomenal. You know what was incredible? I saw a, I saw a young man with a small frame right now try to take a blow to his chest, and I was like, "You better you better beat him now because when he does, 
put on weight. It's over. Mm-hmm. Mo, he's trying mm-hmm. to play with his chest right now. And I was like, oh, wow. he's He understands the position. And I was so impressed with him. That's why I'm because I was like, he's going to be whoever he's supposed to be. Yeah. Right now, Mo, he doesn't have enough size to be trying to play the game with his chest. <laughs> he's like, yeah. he, he's he's little. But and if he gets through these first three years in the NBA, Mo, the NBA has no chance. You have no chance to beat this guy. I don't not know. Because <laughs> we can do this all day. Appreciate you guys for tuning in. Um, I want to go out and hoop now, but it's snowing in England, B Day. It's very oh, depressing. it's even better. So, it's, uh, it's even better because Mo, you, you, it's even better now. You know, you don't have to, to worry play. about you don't have to worry about transition offense now. You, 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 you can slow the game. <laughs> hey, 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 Mo. Perfect. Uh, I'm getting if sixty. You, if you are the if you are the player, you tell me you are. You like to play with your back to the basket. It's the Hell perfect yeah. game for you. You know, yeah. the problem is no one else wants to play. But uh, that's a, that's oh, okay. a whole other conversation. Uh, appreciate you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and all that good stuff. We'll be back tomorrow with more from the Hoop Genius Podcast. Make sure you get buckets.